Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Kick Out Hatter Inquiry, which has been organised by Barnet Newington uh, and sponsored by Barnet and Labour Party, Barnet Momentum, uh, and then maybe a couple of other organisations. Oh, which there, there we go. <laughs> um, it's going to be a bit different from the usual meeting held in here. It's not a um, not discussion, it's not a debate, it is an inquiry. Uh, in which we hope to take evidence from witnesses. Uh, and there's a specific purpose for it, which is, um, as some of you may know, Barnet Council come up to two critical meetings on the future of their relationship with Capita. Uh, on the 11th of December, uh, the Policy and Resources Committee is a meeting, and they can do one of three things. They can either keep all their services to Capita, they could bring them all back in house, or they could bring some back in house. Uh, what they decide will then be ratified the next week by four councils. Um, the purpose of this meeting is to gather evidence from residents, activists, observers, uh, from Barnet and beyond about what their what they're seeing as a capita um, and what they think should happen. Uh, so it's specifically targeted. We've got a lot of people to get through. Um, and so I would just say, for most of the contributions, we're looking to keep them down to about three minutes or so. Uh, so please be as concise as possible. Um, I'm going to throw to John McDonnell in a moment, who puts in a bit of big context. Uh, but I, I want to say just one, um, one thing. Um, it's right, particularly appetite. I know that you've all been having meetings in Barnet and elsewhere about the future. Uh, but it strikes me as appetite to be having a meeting like this here in the Mother of Parliament because one of the things about outsourcing, and it's not exclusive to Barnet, it happens time after time after time, is how undemocratic it is. In that once services disappear into a giant outsourcer, you don't really get to see what happens next. Everything becomes very opaque. Yeah. And this is one of the themes I know of Barnet in particular. Um, the other thing, obviously about this moment, is you're at a time when council after council from uh, Sussex up to Birmingham and beyond are rethinking their relationship with outsourcing. And of course you have the evidence of the failures of outsourcing all around you from Korean onwards. Um, so just on that note, I'm going to hand it across now to John Okay, Just two, two minutes really. Um, apart from my role, which is the most popular way to inform the IT, which is booking rooms for John Day, <laughs> in this, in this place. Um, my other role over the last what, decade, I suppose, has been involved in the various farmer campaigns um, against privatisation, about, against outsourcing, and to expose um, the role of a Conservative Council um, in cutting services and undermining the public services for the local community. Um, some of you will know I've been on various picket lines with, with Unison and um, Jeremy and I were on that famous open bus, bus demonstration, um, which also determined that I was worried about the, the judgment of the campaign because it was snowing at the time. Snowing was the Barnet Supreme But the reason we've been along each time we've been involved, and all of you have been involved in the campaign, is because the outsourcing has produced a regime which has resulted, as we know now know, in the corruption. Prosecutions for fraud that's taken place on some scale as set out in the recent case. But in addition to that, it's, it's resulted in as the said, services going out of the control of the local community, and then as a result of that, poor delivery of service and cutbacks on the services themselves. And I think it's a, a really good example of the iniquities of outsourcing that others should learn from. And it's interesting as well, actually. There are a number of Labour councils at the moment that are now rejecting cap capital, ending their relationship with capital. Certainly in terms of national policy making for the Labour Party now, we've made it very, very clear. We, we have a preference for insourcing, we're opposed to outsourcing, we're opposed to privatisation. But in addition to that, there are other issues that have come from this that we've got to learn lessons from. So a couple of things that we're doing at the moment We've commissioned a review of regulation overall. And a, a guy called Prem Seeker is a professor of accountancy. 
He brings together a group that we've been working with for the last decade, at least called the Corporate Abuse Reform Group, and they're doing a report first, which we'll publish shortly into regu regulation overall, demonstrating that regulation at the moment, including the regulation of <coughs> audit and accountancy, is severely lacking. In fact, a lot of the regulation is self-regulation, which is extraordinary. In addition to that, there's a multiplicity of bodies uh, which are, I do think are not in any way productive in terms of allowing to have a so appropriate audits and effective audits, etc. We're also producing a report uh, specifically on the role of the four big audit companies as well. There's a review that's been go that is going on at the moment too, that the government have commissioned um, to the Conference of the Markets Authority. And what we're doing is producing a separate report that we'll submit to it too. Because there's a real issue here about these companies not only do the audit, but they also send sell consultancy services as well. And there's issues around conflicts of interest that need, need to be resolved. There's also issues obviously about the um, relationship with companies like Capita who can dominate a market and squeeze others out. So it is an even fair competition, I think that, that goes on. The solution, I'll just say this, babe, the solution is bringing in house. It's obvious, I think it's starkly obvious. And uh, we've got Labour councillors here you know, repressing about the need to bring these services back in house. And then the second solution, obviously, is to have a government that will actually fund the local government rather than cut the grant year on year in the way that that's taken, that taken place here. So I'm here for now to listen to some of the evidence that's, that's, that's been produced. Uh, and all the way along now, you'll see as we've developed national policy from the Labour Party, a lot of it has been based upon what's been reported back to us about our local experiences. But Barnet, is all, Barnet has almost been like a testing bed for some of these policies that the, the Tories have used at the local level. And it's interesting just how much, how stark the failures have been in their relationship with the company. So thank, thanks for inviting me along. And, uh, and as I say, I'm just so pleased to be able to perform my traditional role of booking rooms for John. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what we thought we'd do is we'd have the people who were given evidence to come and sit up here. And so since we've got three seats, you might as well be in three at a time. So um, John Dix, Theresa Musgrove, and Roger Titchborn, if you wouldn't mind just coming up, uh, have a seat. big numbers. So the first big number of which today is £361 million. Pounds. £361 million, that's a lot of money. That's what we've paid in Barnet to Capita in the last five years. Now there's another number, £109 million. That's what we've paid Capita in extras. That's things like special projects, uh, gain share, guarantees, £109 million. Now, for that amount of money, you'd expect to get a really great service. But instead, what we've had is really poor performance. Lately incorrect annual accounts, fines from the pension regulators, IT failures, guaranteed revenues that aren't guaranteed, conflicts of interest, and most recently, the fraud. Now, the Grant Thornton report was commissioned following that fraud, highlighted just what a structural mess this contract is in. Silo structures and silo working, failures of one department to understand what another department's doing, services falling down between the cracks between the two contracts. I call it institutionalised indifference. Not good, but good enough. Good enough to tick the box, meet the KPI and get paid. But not what people expect or deserve. <coughs> we were promised better service for less money, what we've got is worse service for more money. Now, it's one interesting quote a while back, and I thought I'd share it with you, and it goes like this. For the public sector, the only certainty in 2018 is that there will be more uncertainty. 
This means customers will want more short-term and flexible responses to their needs. And guess who said that? Capita, the head of Capita Local Government. And actually, he's dead right. He is right. Right now, Barnet need the ability to be flexible in the short term. But guess what? We're locked into Capita. Ten years was always far too long for a contract of this scale and complexity in a time of financial uncertainty. The lack of flexibility means that we're hamstrung by contractual liabilities and the only wriggle room that's left to meet this £68 million budget shortfall we're facing um, over the next couple of years is to cut services that aren't outsourced and they're frontline services. Now we've got a window of opportunity to think again about how the council's structured, how synergies between departments can be exploited by clustering services together, something which cannot physically be achieved under the current outsourcing contract structure. And that's a really important point. I'm sure that actually we could not only deliver more efficient services, but actually they'd be more cost effective because everybody will be working to the same goals and objectives. And the saddest thing I see in Barnet is a group of hard-working frontline staff who aren't listened to, who are undervalued and who are excluded from the process of making council services better, even though they've got all the skills to do that. And it's not a lack of desire on their part, it's a lack of opportunity. And that's being created by weak leadership who haven't got a clear vision of what could be achieved in Barnet. There's a phrase I like to use, which is, management is about doing things right, leadership is about doing the right things. Currently in Barnet, we have neither good management nor good leadership. What we need is a leader that has a vision, that has ability to build a strong management team, and most of all, a leader that will do the right thing. And that means kick out capita now. Thank you. I'll go next. Yeah. Um, John just spoke about leadership. Um, all of us, we're all bloggers in Barnet. We've attended probably hundreds of council meetings over, for me over the last ten years. Um, about five and a half years ago, the deputy leader, the person who's really driven the outsourcing, is um, Councillor Daniel Thomas. About five and a half years ago, at a meeting, we were discussing this, and this was before the contracts were signed, it was all going through. And I, I was asking a couple of questions, as is my democratic right, and as something we all should do as concerned citizens. Um, about Capita and about the forthcoming one Barnet contract. And he said, in five years' time, you won't have anything to write about. You're, all you bloggers will have egg on your face. People will be queuing up to come to Barnet from other councils to see how we do it. <laughs> and yet here we are, here we are today. Now, uh, around the same time, there was a scandal that us bloggers exposed in Barnet. Uh, a, a different outsourcing company, a company called Metpro. Mm -hmm. John probably hasn't heard of Metpro, he might have done because he does follow the market, but Metpro um, provided security services to the council. They looked after vulnerable people, they shuffled the mayor around. Um, we found that they didn't have security uh, industry accreditation to do this, and so vulnerable people were being shuffled around by people who hadn't even had DBS checks. And um, as a result <coughs> of the fuss that we kicked up, there was an audit inquiry done into this. And they found that not only that, they'd been charging VAT when they weren't VAT registered. <laughs> um, they'd been charging about 30% over the industry rate. They were, they were getting up, I think it was about three quarters of a million a year or something like that from Barnet. Um, the question was, if you can't administer a contract of three quarters of a million, how can you administer a contract of a billion pounds a year? Now, residents in Barnet, residents in Barnet are seeing this. I mean, my, my grandfather, my, my mother, my father are buried in Hendon Cemetery. Hendon Cemetery 
is managed by Capita. Now, if I was running a company that managed something really well, I would have managed by Capita on the notice. You will not see that in Hendon Cemetery. Because when I go to see my grandparents' grave, it's disgusting. Now, it's not only badly maintained, we even had the disgusting, despicable case of ventures that have been donated by people to the cemetery so they could enjoy the experience of sitting with the remains of their loved ones. And Capita wrote to all these people and told them they had to take their ventures away. You know, it, it, it is unbelievable. We had, we had the situation where a young man in Barnet who is autistic, who did work experience my company, contacted me. He'd been kicked off a tube train at Finchley Central because his freedom pass had been stopped, because Capita had enacted a completely illegal policy of cancelling freedom passes for people without any legal justification. Now, these are just two small things. On the doorstep when we were canvassing in May, you talk to people about capital, and they say, well, how does it affect us? And you say, well, have you got relatives in Hendon Cemetery? Yes, they have. You know, what do you think? It's disgusting, but they don't realise capital's doing it because they don't realize. That is why we have to kick out Capita. Well, I hope you can hear me, can you? Because my voice is going. So, I've been writing about London Borough of Capita, along with my chums here, for five long years. And about the process of outsourcing for much longer, since the days of Easy Council, Future Shape and One Barnet. Which came first? Can anyone remember? Future Shape. <laughs> what was it? Was it Easy Council? Yeah. When we took Barnet to the High Court, some of us, to challenge the mass privatisation, the judge found it impossible to understand the ever-changing shape of what became the One Barnet programme or to identify the points of decision at which it could be challenged. But that being a deliberate strategy by the officers who embedded this uh, whole project, to invent a kind of Trojan horse to enter the city walls and win the war. The truth is that these shape-shifting concepts, and that's hard to say, are all versions of the same thing, or rather part of the same process of metamorphosis, and they all have the same meaning and significance, which is no meaning at all. They're all an act of deception, smoke and mirrors. Because language in corporate culture, which is now embedded in our system of government, is not a medium of communication. Mm. It's the reverse. It's an attempt to obstruct transparency and accountability, to facilitate the exploitation of profit, even at the point of delivering vital public services in a time of austerity. Easy Council was a meaningless idea deployed by a local Tory MP, my MP, Mr Freer, who was in search of a claim to some sort of political vision. It's a perfect testimony to his career. Unveiled as a new model of local government, it was in fact nothing of the sort. It was just another model of outsourcing being rolled out by the same team of companies all throughout the public sector. It's impossible to write about Barnet and Capita without using the metaphor of empire, because that is what we have become, colonised by Capita. The last outpost in a virtual invasion and occupation. You could say it was the 21st century equivalent of the East India Company, perhaps, and an incremental appropriation of land and wealth by stealth for the commercial exploitation of resources. By stealth, and not won by open battle, Barnet was an open city with the keys handed over by our Tory councillors, uh, aided by their senior officers and the cabal of consultants who are moving in and out of Barnet and various would-be tendering companies, again conflicts of interest, uh, convincing them that mass outsourcing was necessary. They could provide better services for less money. Well, did they really believe that? Hard to tell as most of them lack the ability to scrutinise the most basic report, let alone a billion pound budget. If Barnet's Tories are old school, unrepentant neo Thatcherites, they're an evolutionary anomaly, the last of their breed, still living in the days of glory when Margaret's used to sit in the council chamber every election night to see herself re elected and pretended to remember who they were. <laughs> she, was, she was very good at that. Uh, the older members still recount with moist eyes, very touchingly, the tiniest anecdote, you know, about tea towels or cups of tea or whatever. And to the younger one, she's this mythical figure from the past whose spirit still haunts the corridors of Hendon Town Hall. 
And they were very easily persuaded then that their instinctive distrust of the public sector should be reason enough to embark on the whole-scale privatisation. They didn't need much persuasion because their hands-off appro uh, approach to governance and preference for an easy life you know, made, made it a, a short case. And there were reasoned arguments from every side, from unions, from grassroots campaigners like Barney's Alliance, from local bloggers, from Labour councillors. Reports were commissioned from academics, legal advice was taken and acted upon, and we would have won the review if, the, if we hadn't uh, lost the time element. And as we know, the Tory members approved the contracts five years ago without properly scrutinising it. Uh, funnily enough, the contracts were assessed by the same lawyers who wrote them. <laughs> and they may not have read the contracts, but we did, which is how, incidentally, we came to discover that hidden within one section, Roger mentioned the, what we call the crematorium, the, uh, the local crematorium, where they're literally making money out of my dead grandmother as well. Capita had proposed to mitigate the risk of public negative publicity by offering us three discounted free used graves. <laughs> yes, Capita joke hidden in the contracts. Literally, legally binding, I presume, but not one that I particularly want to take up yet. <laughs> so, in the midst of life, we are in death, and always we are in the hands of capital. There is no escape. They own us, body and soul, and no doubt will pursue us into the afterlife, too, having got a contract called the vision of eternal torments in the many rings of hell, which only lax Catholics can understand. Big job, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so the Tory members hadn't spotted, as, as the others have said, the many variations within the contracts, the game share payments. And one example we've mentioned again was, which we uncovered, was the opportunity taken by CAP to gain extra fees, a uh, six-figure fee, for taking over the provision of freedom passes to local residents. And young people with autism were being stranded on buses and deeply distressed because passes were just stopped arbitrarily for no, no reason at all. Only after public art outcry did they um, put them back. Planning enforcement, I think somebody else wants to talk about that tonight, is an area in which profit of shareholders is prioritised over providing a fair and transparent you know, service. You can get pay a fee and get your development fast-tracked. You can even now choose your own planning officer. Now, why would you want to do that? Very odd. But this is beginning to damage the Tory um, vote because it, you know, their, their own natural voters are beginning to see what's happening to the borough and they're in, in serious trouble and uh, they're also making a right mess of the capita pensions which I've had weeks and months of uh, trying to sort that out. I just want to divert and ask you please John to uh, take on board the, uh, the uh, worries about women in my generation who lost six years of pension and uh, need some sort of transitional arrangements. Um, so they stopped using the term Easy Council One Bar and it disappeared and that became the change programme. Now it's just nothing at all, it's just there. Uh, and, you know, scrutiny, there hasn't been any scrutiny. We've had a chair of the performance committee who actually said scrutiny is not meant to be critical. <laughs> so, no, seriously. And he continued to repeat the view, even as late as this year when it was all falling apart, but he only wanted to hear positive comments. <laughs> and it is falling apart now, like the last days of any empire. The rise and fall is, is a slow and painful process, but it's politically expedient for the Tories to, to allow capital to retain a colony here, and they will do, uh, which is, um, you know, it's shocking really, because private profit cannot, should not be made from public services, creates a distance between accountability and the community, <laughs> takes power away from that community, we need local services, local jobs, local democracy. So let's have these rights returned to us and begin to rebuild a system of local government that works for us, for the many, not for you, but not for capita and not for its shareholders. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Um, yes, please do. Uh, can I call up Barbara Jenkins?